Hi, ladies and gentlemen. I had a couple of questions regarding the homework in Chapter 2 and a couple of questions regarding the homework in Chapter 3. So uh, this morning I want to just give you a quick prompt on the way in which you might work through these problems. Uh, nothing real fancy. I just uh, grabbed uh, my friend Garris, who's been kind enough to carve out a little time and help me get these done. So nothing super slick, but hopefully this will give you give you some food for thought. All right, I'm going to begin in chapter two, question number four. As you're working through the chart and answering some questions regarding opportunity cost. Now let's go back to the basic. Opportunity cost talks about the highest valued alternative that must be foregone when a choice is made. All right, kind of intuitively you know that if you decide to do one thing, you're going to give something else up. And this has us working with that concept. Now, I've put together just the bottom of the chart that you see in our textbook. And here are some samples that kind of mirror what you're going to be doing in that problem. What, what happens when we change our situation? What happens when we make a decision to do one thing instead of doing something else? What is our opportunity cost? What is it we give up? Now, on a side note, please know that we don't always have to talk about opportunity cost in terms of money. That's a little easier to do because we can all visualize that. If I'm here today doing this lecture, or if you were here today in class instead of working, you'd give up the money that you could have earned while you were at work. Easy enough to see. But you know, you could be giving up something else, right? If you weren't scheduled to work today and you were in class instead of being at home, what is your next best choice? What is it that you could have been doing? If you didn't have class that day, you could have been sleeping. You could have been at the Y swimming laps. You could have been watching a movie. I mean, you could have been doing 101 other things. Whatever it is that you gave up to go to class, that is a cost to you. Maybe not monetarily, but it's something that you've lost. You lost the time that you could have spent doing something else. All right, so on to the chart. You can see, as our authors had in the book, that they've given us a bunch of information. Total hours for the week, 60 hours are allotted between these two activities, studying and working. And then you can see some information reflected in that table. Grade point averages in their income that could have been earned. So let's start at this top line. If a person is spending 10 hours studying, they're going to end up with a 1.0 GPA that gives them 50 hours to work and they've earned $300 in income. Now, what is the opportunity cost of going from 50 hours of work to 60 hours of work? You've got to be giving up something. Well, when you go from 50 hours working to 60 hours working, you can see what happens to your grade point average. Right now, you're, you're not spending any time studying because you're at work all the time. You know your grades are going to suffer. So you can see your grade point average goes from 1.0 down to 0.0. .0. Congratulations, you've had a tough semester when that happens. What then would be the opportunity cost of something different? Well, let's pick uh, an opportunity cost of going from working 60 hours a week to working 50 hours a week. Okay, there's a benefit to that when you go from studying, and, you know, not at all, to studying 10 hours a week, you can see your grades are going to start improving. So that's the benefit. But you're giving something up, right? When you're spending that extra 10 hours studying, now you're working 10 hours less. You have been making $360 a week, now you're down to making $300 a week. So your opportunity cost of going from uh, 60 hours of work down to 50 hours of work, we can do that and tie it to money by showing that you've lost $60. Well, okay, that's a quick sample related to the questions you see in, in uh, question number four in this chapter. Hope that gets you going. Get back to me if you have any questions. I'm going to take a quick break here, put together the next problem, and then we'll work through that. Ladies and gentlemen, we're back. Question number two, I, I always get some concerns about question number two, and so let's take a look at this because it will set the stage to, for some of the similar problems you'll see later in chapter two's exercises. Question two says this, Janine is an accountant who makes 30 grand a year. Robert's a poor college student, he only makes eight grand a year. All other things being equal, 
who is more likely to stand in line to get a long concert ticket and then explain that to me. Now here's the key phrase that you're going to be able to pick up easier as time goes on. All other things being equal. Very often when people first look at this, they'll say, well, how can you answer that question? We don't know what kind of concert this is. We don't know where it's located. We don't know if this is maybe tax time and the poor accounting chick is gonna be working 48 hours a day. How can you determine who's gonna stand in line longer? Back to that key phrase, all other things being equal. That phrase tells us that we can disregard a lot of the information. We don't have to worry about what time of year it is. We don't have to worry about finals for the college student. We don't have to worry about how long it takes to get to the concert. We're gonna ignore all of that and look at the information that we have been given. Now, we've been given salary information for Janine and Robert. And based on that, we can determine who might have the lower opportunity cost of waiting in line for a ticket because that's really what this question is dealing with opportunity cost the topic of this chapter so let's compare incomes and let's compare what these two might give up by standing in line for a ticket and again all other things being equal don't think about going online to order tickets or any of those other things we're just going to look at the money they lose when they make the decision to wait in line for that concert ticket. All right, Chicky Poo, she makes 30 grand a year. Now there are 20, 80 working hours in a year, but I'm gonna use 2,000 because this old man's mind doesn't process numbers very easily anymore, and working with an even 2,000 will help me work through the calculation easier. 30,000 divided by 2,000 working hours equals 15 bucks an hour. If Janine decides that she wants to go to this concert, she has to take off work and stand in line for a concert ticket, she waits five hours, she's given up $75 in salary. Now, poor Robert, he's like, you are right now, he's broke. He's like, I was, when I was in college, I was broke. He's got eight grand a year of income. If he waits in line, that costs him no money. Eight grand divided by 2,000, four bucks an hour is all he's getting. If he waits in line five hours, <coughs> he's given up $20. I mean, really, $20. You probably lose $20 in a week and don't even know that. But let's go ahead then and look at their salaries. 75 bucks versus $20. He has a lower opportunity cost of waiting online based on income alone. Okay, but it goes back to that key. When our authors tell us how we can frame our thoughts about that question, all other things being equal, we're going to look at the opportunity cost of, based on income, and we're going to forget about all those other variables. Now, as I said a moment ago, you're going to find some similar problems. I hope this gets you prepared to do those problems. And if you'll uh, hang on a second, we're going to take one quick break and go look at one more problem. And we're back. When we broke a moment ago, I told you I was going to look at chapter three. I think what I'm going to do instead is grab one of the problems from chapter one because it will mirror the graphing that you're going to do in chapter three. In your written assignment, I asked you to do question one, exercise one, letter A. When you read through that exercise, you will find that in letter A, you're actually going to draw two graphs. I'm gonna work with the first graph just to give you an idea of how to do this by hand. Now, in response to many of your questions, yes, you can draw these by hand. Just scan them in and then you can put it in the Dropbox. That's probably much easier than trying to figure out how to work with Word, any of the graphing functions contained therein, or Excel if you have no experience in those areas. So please, do go ahead and draw by hand. When you watch the videos for chapter three, you'll see that I did everything by hand. It works as well as using one of the graphing components for me, and it's much more easy, easily done when, when I'm shooting these videos. All right, now some, some graphing basics. 
when, when you're working with a graph, there are four different quadrants labeled one through four counterclockwise, and they represent a series of places that are number pairs, really. They're pairs of numbers, positive and positive numbers, positive, negative, and so forth. When I do my graphing, you can see that I'm going to work in that first quadrant because we're going to be working with positive variables most of the time, and it's just easier to do. So I begin to do my graphing by putting a little piece, uh, a little uh, plane on the paper, and then I start reading through the information so I can determine what data to put on the vertical axis and what data to put on the horizontal axis. Question one says this. In the first graph, you're going to plot um, time on the horizontal axis, and you're going to use pixels in circulation on the vertical axis. And, and you see that information over on page 23 of your check of your uh, textbook. Now, time goes from 1990 up to 2009. I'm going to do this in kind of an abbreviated manner. We, when doing graphing, I'll start with the smallest numbers closest to the place where the corner of this graph is. Technically, you know, there's four different places here, and this intersection of the horizontal and vertical axis represents the number pair zero, zero. So in your mind, if you think of this being zero, you start by placing the smallest numbers there, and for the horizontal axis, then you work to the right. For the vertical axis, smallest numbers would go here, and you'd work to the top. And what you're gonna do then is just put a place on there for each one of those variables. Again, to make it a little easier, I'm just gonna put the starting and ending numbers on here, and you would fill in the difference. So it starts with 1990 and ends with 2009. Now while I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna to have to turn around for a moment. You're gonna to get to see the glaring bald spot on the back of my head. I'm giving you this warning so you can put some sunglasses on and won't be blinded for the rest of the video. On, on the horizontal axis, it says place the time in years from 1990 to 2009. So we have 1990 to 2009. And then it tells us on the vertical axis to, in the first graph, work with pesos in circulation. And pesos in circulation go from 19.6 up to 578. Okay, now you've got supposedly a, a place for each one of these variables. And what you're going to do then, if you're drawing this by hand, is just put a dot for every one of those number pairs. So the first number pair would be 1990, and if you look at the graph, 19.6. That looks like about 1990 and 19.6. The second number you found was 91 and 27. And I'm not gonna go further, you kinda get the idea. So for every one of those number pairs, you plot a dot on the graph paper, and then all you've got to do is connect the dots. It ends up at 578. So that's not nice and neat, but you can kind of get the idea. You're going to have an upward sloping curve. All right, so those are just some graphing basics. Now you've got about three or four other graphs. And again, please know that it's perfectly acceptable to hand draw these and, and scan them in, put it in the Dropbox. Well, I, I hope this gives you some help as you work through these first few problems. As I said, for Chapter 3, you've got some information videos related to the law of demand, and that, in conjunction with this graphing, should help you be able to work through those problems. But I'm glad to help. I'm glad to answer any questions. Um, have a good day, ladies and gentlemen, and we'll talk to you soon.